Hello, and thank you for joining the National Lupus and You event hosted by the Lupus Foundation of America. My name is Ashley Holden, and I'll be the host for tonight's program. Our topic for this program is mental health and wellness. Here's a brief overview of our program. As you can see, we have a full agenda as always. I'll kick us off by sharing more about the Lupus Foundation of America, some helpful resources and ways that you can get involved. We are so excited and honored to have tonight's speakers and I want to thank them ahead of getting started tonight for joining us. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. If you have a general question for our speakers, you can submit it at any time through the Q&A feature. You'll want to click on the Q&A button and then you can type your question for our speakers. If you prefer to remain anonymous, there should be an option to do so when you submit your question. We will have time allotted at the end of the program where our speakers will try to answer as many questions as possible submitted by you. And um, if you have a question that's more specific, um, you can reach out to our health educators at lupus.org slash health educator. This um, program will be recorded. And so you'll receive that in an email as well as a post-event survey where you can submit feedback about tonight's program. And then we also will have portions where you can interact throughout the program. So we'll have polls where you can interact and respond to give us some more information as we go through. We'll go ahead and do our first poll that we have. Give us just a second to get that popped up. So what topics are you most interested in for tonight's program? And you can check all that apply. Are you most interested in more about coping with diagnosis difficulty, navigating life with lupus, or managing emotions while living with lupus? And I'll give us just a few seconds to answer this. Take just two more seconds and we'll close out. Let's take a look at those results. So it looks like 34% are interested in coping with diagnosis difficulty, an overwhelming amount, 79% interested in navigating life with lupus, and 69% are interested in managing emotions while living with lupus. So looks like we have a lot of interest in tonight's topic. So as I mentioned before we get started, I'm just going to go over a little bit about the LFA and our resources. And so here at the Lupus Foundation of America, we work to meet the diverse needs of all people with lupus, and our commitment has never wavered in our more than over 40 years of service. To put our vision and mission simply, our goal is to one day end the impact of lupus and its suffering while ensuring that we provide the comprehensive support and programs people with lupus need today. We remain committed to doing everything we can to help you navigate the complexities of lupus while rallying every possible resource to end it forever. Today, people with lupus are living longer, healthier lives than ever before, and the Lupus Foundation of America has played a significant role in that achievement. Here at the LFA, our programs are based upon three pillars, which include research, care and support for people affected by lupus and advocacy. We've redefined lupus research, research to expand our efforts beyond just funding research grants. We are engaging key stakeholders to identify barriers that stand in the way of progress and are setting a course to overcome them. We also provide caring support for people affected by this devastating disease and leading advocacy efforts to bring more funding for research and services. Through this, our approach is comprehensive and focused on achieving meaningful results that will make a difference in the lives of people affected by lupus. We align our efforts and resources toward achieving four specific outcomes. The first would be to improve early diagnosis of lupus by increasing awareness of symptoms and educating health professionals so people with lupus can get prompt care and treatment. Secure new, safe, effective, and tolerable treatments for lupus by advancing research, improving how new treatments are evaluated, and educating people about clinical trials. 
expand direct services and increase access to treatments and care by providing resources and advocating for improved health services and affordable medicines. And finally, raise money and secure government funding to operate programs that help people affected by lupus. In the interest of time, I'll keep this brief, but I wanted to share about some of our programs and resources available to you. If you haven't already, I encourage you to visit our website and learn about a lot more programs and services we have available. The first we have here is the expert series, and this is our education podcast with leading experts focused on topics to help you live well with lupus. Next, we have our health education specialists, and that's our team of health educators who are specially trained to provide people affected by lupus with um, caring support, um, non-medical support, disease education, information, and helpful resources. Some of our health education specialists are working behind the scenes of tonight's event to help answer questions in the Q&A box as well. We also have Lupus Connect. That's our online support community where members can engage and ask questions. It's available 24-7, 365 days a year. And then finally, we have our National Resource Center on Lupus. It's kind of a living library, if you will. It's your one-stop resource for all things lupus, from treatment to living and coping with the disease. It aims to ensure that anyone affected by lupus, including people diagnosed, caregivers, healthcare professionals, all have access to high-quality resources that provide emotional support and clear, accurate health information because we know how difficult it is to find accurate, reliable information out on the internet. And we also have a network of support groups that provide a safe and understanding environment where people with lupus can come together and ask questions, listen to others, or lend a helping hand. And this is so important while we talk about mental wellness and coping that this evening um, to be able to find a support system for you. You can visit lupus.org slash local support to find a support group in your community. Many of these support groups do meet by Zoom. So if you don't find one in your area, you are most likely able to find one that you can join remotely. Um, just as we're meeting this evening, you can join in by Zoom and hopefully get that support group that you need. We also have special um, population support groups such as caregivers. We have some for youth um, as well as a couple of others. So we definitely try to uh, make sure that we are taking care of the lupus population and providing those resources. There are also many ways to get involved with the Lupus Foundation of America. And one way coming up this month is our virtual six challenge. So on average, it takes six years for a person to be diagnosed with lupus from when they first notice symptoms. Reducing time to diagnosis is a key part of our mission, as I mentioned, and you can help. Sign up to participate in the Virtual Six Challenge and complete six miles over six days between June 23rd and June 28th, 2023, however or wherever you choose. You can walk, run, jog, hike, bike, swim, or paddle indoors on a treadmill, stationary bike, or even outdoors, whatever you choose. Complete one mile per day, all six miles at once, or any combination. You can make it work for you. You can find out more about the Virtual Six Challenge and how to register at lupus.org slash virtual six. Next, we have our next poll question and give us just a second to get that up for you. So the next poll question is, do you feel comfortable discussing your mental health with your provider or providers? And the options are yes, no, sometimes, or it depends on the doctor or situation. And again, I'll give us about 10 seconds to answer this. Just take another second or two, and we'll go ahead and take a look at those results. See if we can get those results to come up. Bear with us just for a second.
I do apologize about that. I'm not, oh, here they come. Um, so the, we have 43% that said yes, 9% that say no, 14% say sometimes, and 34% say it depends on the doctor or situation. So we have a pretty good spread there. Thank you for participating in our poll questions. And so I'm excited to introduce our motivational moment. And I um, this will be Victoria Gibbs. So Victoria began practicing yoga 10 years ago. And from the first time that she stepped onto her mat, her passion was evident, shaping her into the woman she is today. Victoria is a Dartmouth College graduate, a former financier turned health and wellness entrepreneur. She is also a full-time yoga athlete, instructor, model, influencer, digital content creator, and lupus warrior. Victoria genuinely believes in the mind-body benefits of yoga and has found that it is helpful for her to overcome, has helped her to overcome mental and emotional struggles and supports her in maintaining optimal physical health while managing lupus. Today, she lives to share her journey through teaching, education, and content. Victoria, thank you for joining us. Um, I will turn the, the program over to you. Thank you so much, and I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Um, I was diagnosed with lupus back in June of 2016, um, actually on my birthday, which is this coming Friday. So June is always kind of a little bit of an emotional month for me just because that's when everything really began. Um, and it was interesting. I have to say I was very committed to my life. I had a full-time job at a hedge fund. I was practicing uh, yoga every single day, 90 minutes in the studio commuting in and out of the city, um, living a very full social life and training for a yoga competition, which sounds a little bit, you know, interesting, I suppose. But uh, for me, that was a nice way to kind of channel my energy. I grew up dancing classical ballet. So movement was always medicine and gave me peace of mind and focus and just calm in my everyday life. And eventually I started to notice random symptoms were occurring um, only through 2016. I mean, I'm sure there were symptoms prior to that, but that's when things really started to move south. And while I was training for my competition, I basically, my whole body collapsed underneath me, it felt like, and I stopped working. Um, and eventually had to spend my summer at home in Princeton after finally getting a diagnosis of lupus. And it was in a disease that I had never even heard about and didn't know what life was going to look like, didn't know how I was going to <clears throat> necessarily navigate that. But the good thing was I was home with my family and they were able to really be a pillar of strength for me during that time of uncertainty and unpredictability. Um, and during that time, I kind of isolated a little bit because I just didn't know what was even happening with my body, what was going on. All of a sudden, I'm just taking all of these meds to kind of keep myself alive and keep myself thriving. And um, I was no longer able to practice yoga anymore. And so I was looking for something to channel my energy and I began writing. Um, I started a journal just about my daily feelings and eventually turned it into a gratitude journal. And every single day I would wake up and write and just share my feelings because it was something to where I didn't know anyone else who had lupus at the time. And so, you know, talking to family and friends is one thing, but to actually have to experience something on your own is something totally different especially when you can't answer what's happening with your body or why it's fighting you and how to emotionally cope with that. And even prior to lupus, I'm someone who was a little bit, I would say, emotionally not unstable, but just 
working through life trying to figure out how to find the best balance, which is why yoga was so pivotal for me um, all the time in my daily life. And so to have lost that, journaling became my new outlet. And thankfully, I mean, I was able to get back to my practice and get back to what seemed like a normal life. Um, I went back to finance, only really working primarily part-time and whatnot, but it was at least nice to be able to get back into the swing of things and feel like I was doing something for me and not be a victim to lupus. Um, I made sure to take the time to really understand and work through the fact that I could not allow lupus to define me and not necessarily let it slow me down. Um, I'm someone who needs to remain busy and thrive in whatever capacity possible that is, um, sometimes to a fault. But I think with lupus, it was not the end of the world, but for me, a new beginning where I could actually take some time to educate myself on lupus and the resources that are available to me and like I started out saying, movement was always medicine. And so to be able to try to insert movement back into my daily routine, I think was exceptionally helpful, um, especially yoga. There's such a deep mind-body connection that after my diagnosis, I actually feel as if I was able to cultivate a deeper connection and self-awareness and self-care and self-love that I wasn't able to prior to my diagnosis. Um, and just being able to take that time on my mat, not necessarily every day, but just whenever it was available to me, I think was very helpful in just calming my mind, calming my body. Um, and it gave me the tools to actually understand as well if my body was if my body was healthy at that moment, if there were certain things that I couldn't do on my mat or my joints were hurting or things felt uncomfortable, I knew it was time to maybe just step back, reassess. And I used it as a tool to really help me manage my body and how it was feeling and what it needed to thrive and survive on a routine basis. Um, so I went on in that same vein for quite some time, but eventually uh, I had a really bad flare up in 2019 and I was hospitalized for a week. And after that week um, in the hospital, I actually left the hospital and embarked on a yoga teacher training just because I needed something in my life to give me additional resources to again, calm my mind and just understand what was going on with my body and cultivate a daily practice of mindfulness and meditation along with movement. And so I went along and did my teacher training. And at that moment when I had finished, I basically turned my life over to wellness completely. I had never felt more balanced and just overall healthy. There were moments where I realized, okay, I need to prioritize myself and my needs only. I mean, with lupus, you have to be somewhat selfish and as hard as that can be for most of us to do. Um, I think it's one of the most pivotal things that you can do because you have to you just have to prioritize everything that you need. If you're tired, you need to take the extra time to rest. If you are feeling stressed, maybe remove yourself from a situation. If an individual is stressing you out, maybe that's not the right relationship for you. You have to really dive into what's going to serve you. And so from that moment on, I multiple times a day actually meditate both on and off of my mat. Even if I'm just walking down the street, I take moments of deep inhale breaths and full exhales and just feel my shoulders falling away from my ears and just feel like the whole world is falling off of my shoulders. It just, it feels good. It feels right. I mean, it's not the easiest thing to embark on. So mindfulness definitely is work, but it's work that is worth it. Um, 
I go to bed listening to meditations. I wake up listening to meditations. And of course, journaling is always a great avenue as well. And what works for me isn't necessarily going to work for you, but I know that my routine of movement, whether it's gentle movement of just walking or like a full-on yoga class combined with moments of mindfulness, like a five-minute meditation, it doesn't need to be an hour long. I mean, that's not even realistic for most people. Um, But just even taking two minutes by yourself, I think can really make all of the difference. I am someone who comes from a place of constant positivity. I wake up every day just grateful for the good, grateful for the bad. And even the bad things, I use them as an opportunity to learn and grow. I never look at anything in a negative light. I feel like anytime an ounce of negativity like filters into my routine at all, I have to take a step back and reassess, take a deep breath and turn that around into a positive moment because those positive moments are what make all of the difference in navigating life with lupus, especially because lupus is so unpredictable, which is what makes it even harder because some days you wake up feeling like a rock star and then other days you wake up and you just don't even want to get out of bed. And earlier this year, I had spent a lot of time just kind of focusing on self, self-care, self self-love, um, I get a little emotional sometimes when I talk about it, but, um, and I was just meditating a lot, um, every single day, probably three, four times a day, not really sure what came over me necessarily, but I felt like this was something that I had to do for myself. So in conjunction with practicing my routine yoga and whatnot, I was also doing a lot, a lot of mindfulness. And I feel like it was actually preparation for something that was health-wise approaching with lupus. I had open heart surgery a couple of weeks ago, or about two and a half weeks ago, totally unexpected, but it was all from lupus complications. And I went into that experience calm and just kind of ready to like ready to go into battle, so to speak. It was just an experience that I'd never expected to happen at 37. It was also a very, it was like an empowering moment. I just felt like paired and calm. And I think because I have been working on mindfulness and the importance of it from day one, up until like the day of my surgery and day one is like my diagnosis. I feel like it was pivotal in allowing me to really go into that procedure and that moment and that operation and like know that I would come out okay and be fine. I mean, of course, in the moment it can be frightening and we can't allow our fears to overcome us and slow us down and turn whatever we're going through into just the most poor me, why me moments, but I looked at it as as an opportunity again, and I'm like, well, here we are, at least they caught it when they caught it, and, you know, I'm going through this now, and, you know, I'm being used as a vessel to maybe hopefully share this experience with someone else and share with everyone how I got through it and how I'm, like, you know, taking it day by day, breath by breath hour to hour knowing that I'm going to be okay with the support and love of my family and friends and whatnot so apologies for the emotional moment but it happens sometimes Um, but that's another thing if you're feeling the emotions you kind of have to let them come and let them go and just embrace them because they're going to come up it's part of this journey I mean if you don't feel the emotions you're doing yourself a disservice. It's better to feel them, accept them, and then just kind of surrender to them, surrender to what's about to happen, surrender to the moment. Don't try to control it because we can't control the lupus. It just, it is what it is. And so the more we can let go and allow ourselves to really just accept where we are on any given day with how we're feeling and what we're going through, the better off we'll be. And then of course, there's always these amazing opportunities where we can all 
share with each other and use each other's resources to, you know, help help one another. I mean, that's what it's all about. And that's why I take so kindly to moments like this, because I feel like it's so important, at least for me, it has given me so much peace and calm to share my story um, on so many levels. And even on social media, I feel like it's important to do that too, because it's a, it's a disease that nobody really knows anything about. And so the more that we can share and support each other and use the resources available to us, I think it really can make all the difference. And if you can do your best to keep up with your movement, even if it's gentle movement, five minutes of walking or two minutes of deep breathing can really make all of the difference. And so just embrace it and just take it one day at a time, but be patient with yourself, always have grace. I know that every day is gonna be different, but it's always, it's always what you make it. So always come through with a positive frame of mind, even, even on the hardest days, find something to celebrate. Thank you so much for being raw and emotional with us. And thank you for joining us just a few weeks after having surgery. I absolutely love the, the point that you made about the mindset of, of really nothing's bad that you learn and grow from good and bad situations. Um, I see an overwhelming amount of support for you in the chat. Um, so if you have a moment, I look, at, look at all those messages that are there to support you, which is the point of tonight's um, a session. But again, thank you so much. Um, you're truly an inspiration. And I see a lot of people that really relate to what you shared. Thank you. So um, after hearing that um, inspirational moment, we are going to move to our second speaker. And so we have Angela Bodie. And so Angela is from Los Angeles, and she enjoys spending time at the beach, watching old movies and reading. She is, a, she is compassionate about helping people heal. Angela has been a care partner to family members and has an organic understanding of the angst, fatigue, and potential health challenges associated with care partnering. Angela has worked in the healthcare system in various roles for over 25 years. She has provided psychotherapy, support, and education to patients and their family members in the healthcare system for quite some time. Angela has obtained her bachelor's degree at California State Dominguez Hills and her master's degree in social work at the University of Southern California. Angela opened her private practice in 2017. She is licensed to practice in California. Her niche includes working with adults struggling with physical illnesses, disabilities, depression, anxiety, reproductive issues, adjustment disorder, isolation, low self-esteem, marital conflict, grief, and loss. And she sounds like she is an absolute wealth of knowledge for us this <laughs> evening. Angela, thank you for joining us. I will turn the, the presentation over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley. I'm humbled to be here. And I just want to give uh, Victoria a big hug from me, a virtual hug. Um, thanks so much for sharing. Um, it was very heartfelt. I can feel it through the the airways here. So again, my name is Angela Bodie. I am a licensed clinical social worker and I am the founder of the Hope and Wellness Partnership. I am not diagnosed, or I have not been diagnosed with lupus, um, but I have worked with patients uh, throughout several years that are experienced lupus symptoms or also have kidney failure. So again, I'm honored to be here. Next slide. So I wanted to dive in here um, with an overview of what we'll be talking about. And most of this, um, Victoria covered, so it just really falls in line. So emotions associated, associated with being diagnosed with lupus, grief and loss, the path to acceptance, finding hope, cultivating a new life, and helpful resources. So the initial shock. Um, Victoria, she kind of tapped on this, but I'll go into it further. A lot of patients come to me when they've been diagnosed with lupus or other chronic illnesses, and they tell me it feels like they've been, you know, knocked off their feet. They had no idea this was going on. Um, this can't be happening to me. Um, I've done everything I'm supposed to do. Why is this occurring? These are all natural emotions. I want to make sure that we emphasize that. These are natural emotions. When you're diagnosed with any chronic 
illness or terminal illness, you're going to feel afraid. You're going to feel confused. You're going to feel like, you know what, I don't know where to go. And that's completely normal. You may withdraw from your partners, your spouse, your good friends, your kids, because it's a moment where you need time to isolate. It's a time where you need to recover from this. So again, I want to make this known that this is completely normal. Please feel free um, to express yourself in the chat if you've ever experienced this, no matter where you're at on the, the scale within the diagnosis, diagnosis point, let me know if you've experienced this initial shock. Um, next slide, please. So some of the emotions, again, that you experience with being diagnosed with lupus, of course, we talked about shock. We talked about the sadness that occurred. There's low mood, right? Sometimes there's depression there, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. There's fear. There's uncertainty. You have no idea where your life will be in the next day, month, or year. So absolutely, it's important that, to know that you will fear some sense of, I'm sorry, you will experience some sense of fear. Some patients have expressed shame. They're ashamed of being diagnosed with lupus. They're ashamed of sharing this illness with others. They do not want to attend support groups. They do not want to share their diagnosis with their family. They feel in some way that they're responsible for this and they feel as if it's a, a disease. And um, this really takes some time to work through because as you know, we have to get rid of the shame in order to move forward and ask for support. Another thing is disbelief. Again, why is this happening to me? Victoria spoke to this. I've done everything I'm supposed to do. You know, she's practicing yoga. She's getting on with her life. She went to school. She's eating well. What the heck is happening? Why me? Why me? So that's the emotions where you feel this disbelief and you don't understand why this is occurring. Um, next slide, please. So again, the why me? You wonder why me? You ruminate on things. You consider, you know, why is this happening? You're physically active. You're eating right. You're doing everything that you're supposed to do. And then you start blaming yourself. You're blaming yourself for a condition that you had nothing to do with. There's nothing that you can physically to do to get lupus. It's not like it's um, a disease, uh, and I'm going to say AIDS, and just to be open, um, use that for example, or any other condition where it's a, a, a like, I can't think of anything, I'm sorry, but it's not something that you contract. This is something that happens to you over a lifetime. There's no reason why lupus occurs with some and not with others. So that is very common for you to blame yourself. Um, why are you experience, what do you experience is completely normal. Um, it's a form of grief. And that's something that people experience and there's no issue with that. Grief comes in many forms and it's experienced differently with everyone. Next slide. Stages of grief. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. She has the five stages of grief. Later, another author added two more stages, but I thought we'd just stick to the five stages. Um, the denial. Remember denial in all these stages within this grief pattern is a form of protection for us. Our mind is designed to protect us. Can you imagine handling all these life events handling work, handling our kids, handling school. And if you give, if you're diagnosed with lupus, adding that to that, how overwhelming that can be for you. So our, our body is designed, our mind is designed to slow everything down. So what happens sometimes we deny, deny things are happening. Um, again, it serves as a protective uh, form for pet people that feel overwhelmed. There may be some anger involved. You may be upset with other people. You may protect anger against them. Mad at your husband for doing things that is not in his control. Mad at your boss for being your boss. Mad at your coworkers or even mad at yourself. That's when we get back to that blame. Um, then there's a part where bargaining occur occurs. That's that hope phase. You know what? If I do this, maybe that'll occur. If I change the way I um, 
my activity during my standard of care. If I change my activity, maybe I won't be diagnosed with lupus. Maybe I can reverse it in some way. So that's the bargaining. Then we have depression, as we discussed earlier. Um, and depression is not so much clinical at this stage. And when we say clinical depression, we mean two weeks or more of sadness, feeling overwhelmed, feeling um, loss of hope, not wanting to do your daily activities, um, sleeping too much or sleeping too less, eating too much. So those are the things we work, walk, I'm sorry, we watch for, but these are all stages of grief and they are not linear. They can happen at any time within the diagnosis phase and even after. So this can happen for a lifetime. You can go through these stages and think you're absolutely fine and you get right back to the denial phase. Okay, the thing I wanted to really focus on is the next stage of grief and that's acceptance. So acceptance at this stage, you are open to receiving education and information. You have accepted the fact that you must move forward with the medical advice given this does not mean that your grieving process is over. This does not mean you're giving up to the condition. This does not mean, again, that you're giving up to the condition. But this provides an opportunity for healing. It provides an opportunity for hope. It provides an opportunity for connection with others, connecting to a support group, reaching out to a therapist if needed, reaching out to a doctor that you feel comfortable with reaching out to a friend. So acceptance is a phase or a stage I want everyone to get to. But sometimes it takes a prolonged amount of time. Sometimes people get to that stage in a fair amount of time. But I'll just tell you, um, if you are within the denial or the anger phase, it makes it really hard to navigate this illness. Acceptance is a place that we want to be. But we're going to honor your feelings, the emotions we talked about. We're going to honor what's happening in your body and your mind. But again, we want to get to a place of acceptance. Next slide, please. Steps to acceptance. Victoria talked about this as well, making sure you distinguish yourself from your illness. You are not your illness. You are not lupus. You are not lupus. You are a person that has been diagnosed with lupus. You are not the condition. If you get wrapped up in being lupus, your day-to-day -day movements will be different. You'll move like a lupus patient. Remember, it's all about our mind, how we think, the thoughts we put in. Not saying that you won't have any physical complications, but just knowing that you are not your lupus and you won't live your life as Angie or so-and-so, a lupus patient. You will live your life as someone, a warrior, a strong person that's fighting through lupus. I hope that makes sense. Um, allowing your time, time for reflection, taking time to breathe, um, do what you can, give yourself the gift of compassion, being patient with yourself, honoring your feelings, honoring your thoughts that you're having, writing them down, sharing those thoughts. If you have problems with physical capabilities, maybe you're not able to do the things you were able to do yesterday. And you go back to that point, you know what? I'm kind of upset with this condition. I used to be able to do this. And I used to be able to do that. Stay focused. Stay focused. Yes, I used to be able to do that. But now I have to do it this way. Show yourself compassion. Share your concerns uh, with someone you trust. I've said this numerous times. It's very important um, to get to a point where you find someone that you trust. Um, the Lupus Foundation of America, they have a wealth of resources out there for you. Um, I believe you can even attend the support groups and you don't even have to click the camera. You can just be there to hear and learn what other people are going through and it provides some normalcy for you. So I would suggest that you do that. Uh, recognize the signs and symptoms of depression. We talked a little bit about depression, um, low mood, um, sleeping too much or not sleeping enough. Uh, poor appetite. Um, some people have thoughts of wanting to harm themselves, suicidal thoughts. If you get to that point, you need to call and reach out to help. The number is 988. And that's across the country, 988. At any time, your mood gets so low where you're like, I cannot make it. I cannot do it. Call 988. If not, go to your nearest emergency room. Anxiety, real quickly. Um, anxiety comes about 
And these kind of cross each other. So it can be confusing when we're diagnosing this. But anxiety is feeling nervous, um, being worried about more than just lupus, but worried about everything, trouble relaxing, being jittery, um, feeling restless. So again, if you're feeling these type of symptoms, you need to talk to someone about that. Even before these symptoms occur, even when you're going through the stages, when you're first diagnosed, reach out to someone, reach out to a mental health clinician. If you're not diagnosed with depression, if you're not diagnosed with anxiety, if you're not uh, diagnosed with adjustment disorder, which means you're just adjusting to this condition, you need to reach out and speak to a mental health clinician that can support you with this. We just don't see people with pathologies. We see people that are navigating life. And this is definitely something you need help with. Next slide, please. Cultivating a new life. How do you cope with this condition? Now, these are just a few things. This is not all inclusive, right? So take some time to discover your strengths. As adults, we've been through several things throughout our life. Think about it. Find that time when you felt time, where you felt down. Find that time where you felt um, you couldn't make it, where you had financial concerns, or you were in school and you're having challenges, challenges then. What was your strengths? What were your superpowers then? You're gonna need to pull those up again to get through this condition. Um, consider a new hobby, journaling, like Victoria talked about. Um, you can also do photography. Um, I always tell my patients, you don't have to just write in a journal. You can take a picture of your mood that day and that's your journal for the day you know, capture it, put in a little folder inside your camera, and you can share that when you come into therapy, or you can share it with yourself and your friends. Track your emotions. How are you feeling? Uh, with lupus, it can be very tricky. Uh, what's going on with the system? Um, you could be fine one day, the next you will be overwhelmed. Track those emotions. Monitor your intake, not just what you're consuming internally, but the chaos that is going on around. You may have to step away from the chaos. It could be work. It could be friends. You're finding yourself. You're finding the newness of yourself. This is an opportunity for you to grow and to conquer this, um, but you have to be able to um, open, be open to some of these suggestions. And again, seek out mental health condition as needed. Don't be uh, feel afraid or don't feel that it's something that only people with um, that, and I'm using this word very loosely, that are crazy. Um, that's not a word we use in our profession, but it's used quite often um, within the, 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 the real world. But no one's crazy. No one's crazy. Everyone needs support. Even uh, clinicians seek out support. So do not feel shame. Do not feel, be fearful. We're here to help you. And finally, resources. Um, I included some here. Um, National Alliance of Mental Health, they're really good uh, with educating uh, individuals about different mental health disorders. Psychology Day Today is a good resource for finding a mental health clinician across nationwide. National Institute of Mental Health, the same there. You can find out education about different illnesses, mental illnesses. Suicide and crisis outline is there for you. Substance abuse, if you have any concerns with substance use or abuse, that's a good resource. Um, I also included a movie that's really cool um, about a woman diagnosed with lupus. It takes a look into how she navigates the dating life, which I, I feel that's another conversation we can have about uh, being diagnosed with lupus, when and where do you share that diagnos diagnosis with others a book by Daniel Wallace called The Lupus Book. And then finally, um, I think it's important not to forget the kids um, that are also um, the, the kids of the adults diagnosed. Um, we, we often forget them, uh, but remember they're looking at us and they are taking note of what we're experiencing. So it may be uh, very pertinent to actually share this with them. Um, they can help you um, this book, Why Does Mommy Herp Help You Share Your Condition with Your Child. Thank you so much for your time. Um, remember, the mission of the Hope and Wellness Partnership is to support individuals and their family members through life-challenging illnesses by providing mental health services, education, hope, and effective coping skills. Thank you so much for your time. Be well. Thank you so much, Angela. That was a great presentation. I can't wait to ask you some questions later at the end. Next, I am um, very excited to introduce 
I'm going to apologize ahead of time before I pronounce her name, but I am happy to introduce Dr. Ashley Dangi Kan. She is a staff neuropsychologist and clinician scientist at the Hospital for Sick Children and the Neurosciences and Mental Health Program or Sick Kids Research Institute. On principal investigator for Dr. Andrea Knight's research team, she is a co-investigator on several research studies examining cognitive and mental health difficulties experienced by youth with lupus. Her research has recently focused on identifying and addressing cognitive and mental health disparities in diverse youth with lupus. As a member of the Childhood Arthritis and Rheumatology Research, Research Association, or CARA, she also co-leads task force that is developing mental health screening guidance statements for pediatric rheumatology. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for that introduction. And I just have to go back here to my title slide. Um, I will say I'm, I'm so honored to be able to join uh, my fellow co-panelists today, um, Victoria, um, just echoing that sentiment that Angela shared. I was so moved by your story and I'm sure everyone in this webinar was as well. I think um, it's so humbling to hear about your experiences and I hope, and I, I am very confident that people really drew strength from your story. So thank you for sharing. And thank you, Angela, um, for getting our conversation started about um, what mental health in lupus can look like and how that um, experience can be shaped by a chronic illness like lupus. And I'm hoping that um, I can continue that conversation now uh, with this presentation. So um, Angela, start to tell us about the different ways that lupus can affect our emotional health, particularly in the early stages of diagnosis. I think that was a really um, important process to consider that we can move quite fluidly through those different stages of grief. Um, I'll take a moment now just to give an overview of the different ways that lupus can affect our emotional health. And I think that a lot of you lupus warriors joining us um, will likely attest to this. We know that experiences of pain can certainly lead to changes in our mood and lead to a range of different negative mood states. Um, different medications that we can be on um, can also affect our emotional health. Um, this can range from, you know, having to be on medications and, you know, not wanting to be on these medications, wanting to treat our lupus in other ways potentially, but also the medications themselves can also lead to changes in our mood. There can also be concerns about appearance that, um, you know, medications can sometimes lead to weight gain or acne, or there might be other kind of causes stemming from lupus that can change our appearance that can make us very self-conscious. I'm just going to move around my display here. There's also fatigue. This is probably the number one um, concern that is raised in our clinics from our patients that, you know, they just can't, don't feel like getting out of bed. They can't do the things that they really want to do. And this is really getting them down. Limits to daily activities, right? So things like pain, fatigue, other limitations of lupus like arthritis or, or joint pain can really lead to, um, you know, stopping us from things that we do day to day that um, really lead to us thriving. And we heard about um, some of this reflection earlier as well from Victoria. We might have to miss work or school, and this leads to, you know, not doing as well or not being as productive at work or not doing as well in school as we would like. We might not be able to spend time with friends the way we want. Having flares very unexpectedly and unpredictably can also lead us to feeling down and certainly you know, not knowing what our future is going to be like. And there are likely other causes here, but I think really the message from this slide is that having lupus and the experience of lupus can really take an emotional toll on our mental health. And it's important to acknowledge these things. And we can even take a moment here to recognize if you are someone living with lupus, the types of things that have led to changes in your mood. The Lupus Foundation of America actually um, put out a really 
informative infographic on Twitter in May of 2021. And um, I think these facts are really important to share and for all of us to know more about, to help to kind of normalize a lot of the emotional impact of lupus. Um, one fact is that up to 60% of people with a chronic illness like lupus will develop depression. A lupus flare can trigger clinical depression. Um, and, you know, that experience of feeling ill make it, can make it seem like it'll never end or that you can never be free of lupus. Um, as mentioned earlier, certain medications like high-dose corticosteroids can also play a role in someone developing symptoms of depression. Um, we know that lupus can affect any organ system, including the brain, and that when affected by lupus, this can also lead to symptoms of depression. Something that's also really important to consider is that it can be really difficult for people living with lupus to recognize um, indicators that they're having low mood or signs of clinical depression. Things like lack of energy, difficulty sleeping, sleeping too much can be symptoms of active, active lupus as well as symptoms of depression. And uh, you know, I've had um, patients come to me saying that I'm really tired all the time, but it's because of my lupus. And I think after fur further probing, sometimes um, they come to realize that their mood is actually low, but sometimes people will attribute it more to the lupus and not quite recognize that it could be their mood as well. And for those experiencing, you know, mental health problems, there can be a variety of root causes and it can be one of these or a combination of these things. Um, there can be a lot of difficulties coping with chronic illness um, that can be underlying mental health problems. And Angela did a really nice job of, of normalizing this experience. I think certainly it's understandable that when you are living with a chronic illness that um, this can really influence your mental health very understandably. We know that lupus can have effects on the brain. There might be brain inflammation for some um, people living with lupus that could be leading to mental health symptoms. There might also be um, effects of treatment. So you might be feeling effect on, effects on your mental health directly from uh, as a side effect of treatment, or it could be um, difficulties around coping with the um, you know, the treatments that you're receiving. There might also be genetic factors. We know that um, mental health symptoms or mental health problems like depression or anxiety also run in families. I'll also, you know, review the spectrum of emotional health. I always like to talk to um, the people with lupus that I see in clinic um, and talk to them about the fact that there is a range of emotions that we all experience that is very normal and it can vary day to day um, and it can depend on many things. So um, for many of the young people I see who are living with lupus, um, they, they, um, their emotional health might be you know, really affected by flares or how they're responding to treatment or how their families are responding to their diagnosis. And it can really range. So if they're um, you know, in a flare or they're really, um, they're newly diagnosed and they're overwhelmed by a lot of the treatments that they're being prescribed, they might, you know, be feeling really down. And I like to use the analogy of this spectrum of emotional health as kind of like a battery or like things that are really depleting energy. There might be times when you're feeling like you're in crisis, like you're just, you're running on empty and you might be feeling as though you're just going moment to moment, you're trying to survive. Um, you might be running on fumes and you might feel really low on energy and you might feel like you're, you know, you're just getting, you're, um, you know, just um, trying to survive the day and you're just making it day to day. In the middle, you just might be getting by. You kind of feel okay, but you're not feeling, you might not be feeling anything at all, or you might um, not be feeling well, or, and you might not feel particularly terrible. Um, doing well is when, uh, I like to think of that as you're, you know, doing pretty good. You have no particular concerns and you're using um, coping strategies in pretty productive ways. Ideally, we want to see every lupus patient, at least some of the time, as thriving. 
Um, but again, I will say that I don't want to kind of put values on any of these states. I think that sometimes it's very normal to feel like you're in the red and very normal to feel like you're in the green. And what I'd like to share with you today are strategies that can help us understand um, when we're feeling kind of in this in crisis mode, when we're running on fumes or when we're just getting by, what strategies can we use to help us move towards that thriving more of the time, but understanding that sometimes life just happens and our mood can dip, but all of these um, can be very understandable and very normal depending on what we're going through. So this is something that um, I always like um, to review when talking with uh, people with lupus and their families, because it can actually be a pretty confusing question. How do I know if I have a mental health issue? Um, I think sometimes we like to think that we're always aware, but I think it can be really hard to actually know the answer to this question. Um, there might be some indicators, and Angela st started to um, review some of these, but um, I'd like you to reflect on each of these with me as I go through them. If you're noticing that you're losing interest in things that you used to enjoy, if you're not wanting to spend time with friends or family, if you're noticing changes in your mood and behavior, or noticing changes in your ability to concentrate on school, work, or routine tasks, um, are, you change, are you noticing a change in your sleep patterns or eating habits, like eating too much or too little, or sleeping too much or too little? Do you fear that you're losing control or experiencing low self-esteem, like feelings of shame or guilt? Are you feeling hopeless about the future or talking or thinking about dying? These are all things that could signal that there is um, something to address with respect to your mental health and um, symptoms that last longer than two weeks in any of these domains could certainly be um, something that is more concerning and that um, we would want you to seek help with. So why is addressing mental health important? I think that we all know at a very human level that, um, and want to understand at a very human level that um, everyone wants to be happy. This is all, this is a goal that we have for ourselves and for our loved ones. But there are also very concrete reasons for why mental health is important to address in the context of lupus. One is that mental health problems can negatively affect how successfully um, the disease can be managed. Um, so we know from um, research that mental health problems can um, affect how well we can manage uh, lupus symptoms. It can also affect um, educational status, how far we go in school, and also um, stable employment. Of course, it can affect the quality and enjoyment of personal relationships as well as quality of life. Um, recognizing mental health problems in, um, early on is really important as we know that symptoms usually worsen over time when they're not addressed. And the most important message I'd like to share with you with respect to this question is that effective treatments are available and treatment does not have to include medication. It can include medication, it can be really helpful, um, but there are many ways to address and promote good um, mental health and positive mental health and um, having sadness or worries are absolutely things that um, can change. But let's acknowledge this reality that getting help for mental health problems is really hard. Um, you know, patients sometimes share with me that they don't want their family or partner to know. They don't want their parents to know. What will other people think of me? Um, I've had people tell me there's nothing anyone can do anyway. So why would I tell anyone that I'm struggling? They can't change my lupus and they can't take away my lupus. So there's no point. Um, and other people wonder, do other people with lupus feel this way? Am I the only one? Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, addressing some of these barriers, addressing these stigmas by, you know, accessing some of the supports through uh, the Lupus Foundation of America, but everyone being here, I'm hoping that we can navigate through some of these barriers together. So where, where do people go for help? Where can you go for help? Where can people with lupus go for help? 
Um, one of the big, big things I'd like to promote for everyone today is that um, to really encourage you to approach your rheumatologist or primary care physician uh, or both. And I hope that um, uh, the people on this webinar feel comfortable communicating with their doctors, with their medical team about mental health. I think there is certainly a movement moving towards acceptance in the medical community about how mental well-being can improve overall well-being. Um, but this is certainly a conversation that I think needs to happen. Um, if you have access to a social worker, psychologist, nurses, again, within your rheumatology team or within another medical team that you're a part of, I think that this can be a really helpful conversation. Um, also think about um, counselors that might be available in school, in your religious community, in your cultural community, in your neighborhood, wherever you're situated, consider reaching out, getting connected, um, and harnessing strength in people that you trust, um, including friends and family. I think one of the keys here is that you're not um, experiencing these symptoms alone and knowing that there are people around you that can help. And um, Angela mentioned this um, earlier in her presentation, but if you are experiencing, um, you know, risk of, if you're at risk of harm, um, if you're thinking about harming yourself in any way, please um, call 988, um, call 911 or go to your local emergency room. So there are a range of mental health therapies that are available, and I hope this is a hopeful message for everyone. Um, we heard Victoria earlier talk about her journey of how she found, um, she's always found movement as medicine. And um, I think that this journey can look different for everybody, as she mentioned, right? So um, these are just some of the therapies that could be helpful. So stress management techniques, and this can look like many things. This could be yoga and mindfulness. This might be journaling as Angela was um, walking us through either through words or pictures. This might be deep breathing. This um, really is personal to you. And you have to think about, if you're thinking about that spectrum of emotional health, you're thinking about how to recharge your battery. Um, exercise and sleep improvement. So what are ways to get moving as much as you can and address fatigue by um, you know, addressing issues in sleep routine that might be getting in the way. Support groups. So the LFA, um, Ashley, at, at the beginning of this webinar, talked about some of the support groups that are available. And I think this is a fantastic way to get connected. Um, talk therapy, of course, for those um, who have this um, available to them. Um, seeing a therapist, a psychologist, a social worker to talk through um, some of the uh, emotional experiences that can come with a chronic illness like lupus. Medications are also an option, and this is not, um, you know, something like any of these, I think, um, need to be addressed with your medical provider in terms of what would be most helpful. But for some, medications can certainly help to um, accompany some of these other techniques, uh, and it may or may not be appropriate for you, but certainly something to consider. And again, these can be tailored in, and they can occur in combination. And you might even find that in your mental health journey, in your lupus journey, that the range of mental health therapies that you engage in can change over time as well. I'd like to um, end off my presentation by talking about resilience. I think that um, this is probably the most important um, message of hope that I'd like to give everyone today is that you know, we know that living with lupus is a risk factor for mental health problems. We know that um, there are many things that can occur in, in someone's lupus journey that can lead to low mood or anxiety. But I think that, um, you know, starting with Victoria's story and continuing on to Angela's um, presentation, there are many ways that we can promote resilience. And when I say resilience, I really mean how do we harness strength? How do we, um, you know, move forward with lupus, living with lupus, but still holding on to the things that matter most to us? And I think um, some of these strategies I'll share with you um, are things that I've heard from other people living with lupus, but I'm sure 
the people on this webinar will think of many others. One strategy is to think about how you can harness meaning from your journey. What have you learned from challenging experiences living with lupus? How have these experiences shaped you? Um, how do we build connection? How do we build and maintain positive, healthy relationships? And also, you know, expressing kindness and compassion towards our others can also be a really powerful source of strength. Practicing self-care. So establishing routines for yourself can help in times when we feel less in control. If we have, you know, a routine where we connect with other people, where we spend some time, um, you know, with ourselves, um, sitting with um, negative emotions when they come up and accepting them, but then reaching out to, um, you know, remain connected to our neighborhood, our community, our culture. Um, and scheduling activities that can bring joy can also be really helpful here. Um, there is um, that stage of acceptance that Angela spoke about in terms of knowing that there will be difficult feelings, there will be struggle and grief, and there will be flares, there will be experiences with pain, there will be adjustments to medication, there are all these things that come with lupus, and those things are okay. And, um, you know, people on this webinar may or may not be living with lupus for a long time, it might be a short time, but there were many of you are on this lupus journey, and I think there are certainly people there to support, and um, we want to be able to move towards this, this acceptance where we can hold all those things and know that there is still a way forward. And gratitude. We, this, is, this has also been mentioned a lot in this webinar so far, but you know, strategies like taking notice of good things that happen to you, however small, and expressing gratitude to yourself and others, because gratitude is one of those things that is really contagious. And if we can express gratitude to ourselves and each other, it can really move things in a positive direction. So I hope that um, some of these strategies um, are helpful to those um, listening today. And certainly the Lupus Foundation of America is a wonderful resource for learning more about um, managing um, living with lupus and how to navigate. And I've included um, this mental health resource page that I found on their website. And lastly, I'd like to say it's okay to ask for help. I hope that um, you know some of these things that I have brought up in this presentation and some of um, what my panelists have also brought up really communicate the message that asking for help is a sign of strength. And um, there are different ways to ask for help. And I encourage you to think about what, even if you um, wouldn't um, ask for help right now or don't necessarily need help right now, that you would consider these, um, these different means of resources or means of connection if you ever um, do feel the need to, to reach out. You can certainly communicate with trusted friends or family, um, accessing mental health care access line if you are insurance, uh, if you have an insurance provider, um, calling or texting uh, crisis lines, um, and uh, of course the Lupus Foundation of America page uh, has some great resources as well. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was such great information and a huge thank you to all of our speakers for all of the information that was shared this evening. We'll now invite all of our speakers to come back for our Q&A panel where they can answer the questions you submitted. Um, you still have time to, to submit those questions in the Q&A function. Um, if you still have any, I've been trying to um, write down the ones I see pop up in the chat as well. Um, while I give you guys just a few more seconds to submit anything, I did see one in the chat that asked about um, ways that you can get involved or volunteer to help others with lupus. And so I just wanted to take an opportunity, as I mentioned, if you haven't had the chance visit lupus.org. We have a great section on different ways that you can get involved. Um, you can find different ways that you can do that if you have a local chapter in your area. I also will drop some links in the chat as well for the support group and then some of the other services that we mentioned as well. And we'll go ahead and get started with some of our questions. And Victoria, I will start with you because I saw this pop up a couple of places and people are really interested where they can learn more about 
um, mindfulness, mediation, yoga practice? Where are some of the places that they can go to, to learn about it or find resources? Honestly, online has everything that you can possibly want and desire now at your fingertips. Um, I personally am working on a YouTube channel, which hopefully I'll be able to share eventually. But for now, you can honestly just go to YouTube. And a lot of times when I don't necessarily want to sit by myself, I will just queue up something um, like a healing meditation. And I just put it into Google. It comes up on YouTube and I listen to it um, and sit there and do it with whomever. And then also there's so many just simple basic yoga classes one uh, in particular it's very gentle her name is yoga with adrian uh, she's actually really just it's simple it's to the point it's user friendly and it's easy to follow um, but really just google's our best friend right now i'd like to be offering my personal resources um, as an avenue but for now uh, that's a great just a great resource to check out and it's accessible and at your fingertips, which is really nice. Great. Thank you. Um, Angela, a question for you. Do you have any recommendations for when your family makes it difficult to accept your diagnosis? Wow. Uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know what? Unfortunately, that happens a lot. Um, and so education is always important and also connection with a mental health professional or with the rheumatologist. Um, they do, some rheumatologists do provide support to the family as well as the patient. So I would suggest that the family come in and speak with the rheumatologist um, about the challenges that they're having. Um, I would really like to know more what specifically they were concerned about or what the challenges were. But yes, that would be my suggestion just to team up with a rheumatologist or a mental health clinician if needed. Anything else anybody would like to contribute to that? I will add that we do have some resources on the web on our website. I'm um, just that talk about explaining lupus to others. Um, I think sometimes some of that is that they don't understand lupus and what it is and is not. Um, and so some of those resources can help as well. Actually, I have a question for you. And this one I'm gonna kind of combine two here. Um, but the first part is how can I best communicate my experience with my doctor? And the, the second part to this is that I see a lot of this in the chat, you know, people are hesitant to share their mental health state, their mental health experience, because they've had a difficult road to diagnosis with lupus. They've been told it's in their head. And mm -hmm. so that makes them, like I said, hesitant to share that they might be depressed or experiencing anxiety because they don't want to go through that again. Sure. So I think that, um, you know, there are many, there are, I think this is one of the barriers that we're trying to address. I think with um, with having, for example, um, rheumatologists more routinely screen for um, symptoms of depression and anxiety. So I hope that um, someday filters down to really impacting and normalizing uh, patient experience in terms of sharing mental health symptoms. But um, I think that doing things to help you feel um, really comfortable with that conversation in advance can be really helpful. So if you do have someone that you really trust, um, caregiver, partner, friend, that you can bring with you to your appointment to discuss these things, I think that can be really helpful. Also, just preparing a list of symptoms and things to talk about in advance. I think when we're feeling really overwhelmed and go into an appointment, sometimes we can blank when, you know, we're, uh, the, if your physician asks you, is there anything else you'd like to talk about today? And you're feeling quite panicked and anxious and you don't have things written in advance. It can make that experience feel really overwhelming. So if you um, have specific things you'd like to talk to your physician about, I would suggest writing them down, um, how long you've been feeling those symptoms and how they're impacting your day-to-day -day life, including your lupus care. Um, I think that might be something that um, if you're if you're really noticing some of those effects, that's really important for your rheumatologist or your primary care physician to know is how it's impacting um, your 
lupus disease management and how it's impacting your life, I think that might help them really understand that this is something um, that they should be addressing. Um, but I'm, I'm please, if, if you feel comfortable, bring someone with you that you trust to help kind of um, take the tension out of that moment. May I ask um, add something, Ashley? Most definitely. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Ashley. That's, that's perfect. But at times, um, some doctors may not have the time, right? The, everybody is on this, you know, this real tight schedule and everything is going real rapidly. Make sure you, you get that doctor and you make sure you have their attention. And like Dr. Ashley said, have your talking points there and make sure you go over all your talking points and you check them as you go along. Make sure they understand that you're serious about this. This is something that's really bothering you. And when you capture their attention, you'll be surprised how they have to stop, sit back, and take notice of you and observe your clinical um, uh, surrounding and what's going on. So that's just my suggestion, just to you know make sure you get their attention and, and be kind of forceful at times with them <laughs> in a pleasant way. It's a good point, Angela. Thank you for raising it. I think um, you know self advocacy is really important when it comes to um, promoting your um, optimal management, right? When it comes to advocating for yourself, not only you know towards your family and friends, but it also applies to your healthcare team, right? And helping them understand how you're doing. So I thank you for adding that, Angela. Thank you. And you actually read my mind. I was just thinking self-advocacy as well, um, because there are times where you may see a lupus patient may see a doctor that's not a rheumatologist. They maybe they're in the emergency room and they have a doctor that's not familiar with lupus. And so sometimes you have to be your own best advocate to educate others, unfortunately, about lupus. Um, and I also think if you don't find that you're not comfortable with that doctor in treating your lupus or differentiating your lupus versus mental health, um, you can always seek another opinion as well. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, Victoria, I want to come back to you because I think that there are a lot of people that I saw in the chat and the Q&A that are interested in and how they can incorporate more wellness elements into their day-to-day -day life. If you could pick one thing that might be helpful for someone to start with, what would that be and, and how could they start that thing? Well, the one, I mean, for everyone, it's, it's going to be different just because everybody has different desires and passions and whatnot. But the one thing that I always like to kind of highlight is just to show up, like just find that one thing that you want to try, whether it's just, you know, walking down the block or five minutes in a Pilates class or, you know, just do as much as you can. But I think the hardest part is actually committing to the action and actively showing up for yourself. Um, it's easy to kind of allow things to fall by the wayside, but if you can just commit to the action of whatever it may be, no matter how simple or how complicated, just giving yourself that opportunity to be present for yourself and actually commit to an action. And again, I just keep using that phrase, but show up for yourself, I think is really, is really pivotal. So for me, it's yoga. Uh, some days I want to do Pilates or a hit class or, you know, recently since open heart, I'm just taking long walks now and taking in my scenery and surroundings for the first time ever in Manhattan, which I've never done before. I'm always walking from point A to point B, but um, having the opportunity now to kind of just find moments of stillness and calm and whatnot, I think really make all the difference. So it's about finding what works for you and what's going to serve you and then showing up. Thank you. I love that. It doesn't have to be complicated. We can make it as simple or complicated as we make it, right? Um, another question, and I will, um, Angela, I'll ask this, but if anybody wants to chime in, that's completely fine too. But do you have any recommendations for how you can get your family to recognize or understand your limitations that you may have? Yeah, there's a lot. I think someone posted in the chat to actually go to the Lupus Foundation of America and get the education, which is the first step. Um, but I think it's first about educating yourself. If you don't understand your condition, it's very hard to share those concerns with your family members. So the first point I would say would be to educate yourself. And then also, again, present them with you when you go to your doctor's visits. 
And if you have a doctor that's uh, um, open to the communication and sharing, they will share your concerns uh, with your family members. And the more they, you know, they understand that things work differently for different people as it relates to lupus, they will feel some compassion or show some compassion and be more involved in your care. That's what I would start with. Great recommendation. Thank you. Anyone want to add anything before we move on? Great. Let me go through the questions here. So the, the other question that I have, um, and actually I'll, I'll ask this one to you, but I think a lot of the rest of you can probably chime in, um, is really how do you differentiate symptoms? So sleeping, sleeping too much, irritability, joint pain, how do you differentiate that from depression versus a lupus flare? I say that sometimes it's easy to distinguish and sometimes it's not, and sometimes it doesn't matter. So I'll give you um, a few examples. So there might be, you know, some patients who come to me and they say, you know, I'm, I'm actually, generally, I feel really happy, but I know that um, you know, when I experience pain, I know that my mood is low that day because of the pain, because when the pain goes away, I feel fine. So that would be a clear, like that's that patient is very clearly recognizing that low mood is really attributed to a symptom. And without that symptom, they feel perfectly um, positive and they feel happy. Um, there might be some situations where um, the situation is much more gray. So there might be, um, you know, a family history of, of depression and there might be lupus, right? And there might be, uh, they might be saying, you know, I'm, I've experienced like tired, I've been feeling tired for so long and, you know, I've been feeling really down. There's, a, I'm going through a lot. My, um, you know, my uh, mom just passed away and I'm, uh, my lupus is flaring and there's a lot of things happening for me in all aspects of my life. And I would say that in a situation like that, some there's a lot of overlap in symptoms. This person might be, you know, not sleeping a lot because they're, you know, having a lot of grief from, from you know, losing a caregiver, losing a parent or experiencing other stressors and their lupus is flaring. So there might be both happening. And um, having, and I think, especially when both, when the symptoms are really uh, difficult to distinguish, whether it's lupus or something else, it's really important to communicate those things to your rheumatologist or your primary care provider in terms of, um, you know, coming up with strategies or um, ways to manage both. Because in a situation like that, I would argue it's it really doesn't matter, and you need to have um, multiple ways to to help. Um, people in those types of situations. Um, and if you're, um, if you're not sure which it is, that's also okay, because it can be really confusing. So please be kind to yourself if you're not sure if it's lupus or not lupus. I think that um, a lot of the strategies that Victoria, myself and Angela shared uh, can actually be really effective for both. And um, your rheumatologist or primary care physician can comment on ways to um, change or adjust your treatment regimen to treat potential lupus causes, but um, please uh, take care of yourself as well. Thank you. I think that is absolutely wonderful information. I know so many people can relate to that. It's hard to believe, but we're almost out of time for tonight's program. And so as we close out, I, I always like to ask um, all of our speakers for one tip or one piece of information that you hope that someone takes away um, from your presentation or from this evening's program. And I'll go in the same order that we went for the presentations. And Victoria, I'll start with you. Um, I think the one thing that I would say is to or a couple things, I'll make it quick. Stay positive, stay grateful, and just stay committed to yourself. Thank you, Angela. I agree with that. Um, I'll just say that, guess what? You're gonna be okay. This is gonna be an event that you're gonna have so many positive statements that come out of it. You're gonna show your resilience and you're gonna shine. You will be okay. I love it. And not last, 
last but certainly not least, um, Ashley, your piece of advice or information. I think we all have a really important role to play in supporting each other and making mental health um, a really important part of the conversation when it comes to lupus. So please um, use resources through the LFA, reach out, talk to your, um, talk to your doctor about it, and um, please, please reach out. It's, it's really important. We all, we all need support. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us this evening. As we close out, here is more information on how you can reach out to us at the LFA and how to follow us on social media, which is a great way to stay updated on all the programs, events, and services I mentioned tonight, plus a whole host of other ones. And I know that all of our speakers have done a great job at mentioning all of our wonderful resources we have. So you can find those on our website as well, um, as well as our programs and services. So please, please, please go visit our website and um, check out those resources so that we can help support you. Again, Again, I'd like, I'd to, like mention to mention that, that, we, do that we do have health, have health education, education specialists available to provide people with lupus, their families, caregivers with free non-medical support, disease education, and helpful resources. We also have bilingual health educators that speak Spanish. If we were unable to get to your questions in the Q&A, please reach out to our health educators at lupus.org slash health educator.